today on the Modern Motherhood Podcast from All Mom Does. I'm your host, Julie Lyles Carr, and I don't know about your marriage, but I know in my marriage, uh, there can be some, let's say, strong conversations from time to time. (laughs) Okay, yeah, there can be some fighting, there can be some challenges, there can be some things that I think, huh, how are Mike and I doing at this uh, marriage game? Sometimes it can be a little hard to assess. Well, today I'm so excited to welcome Les Parrott. He has been speaking into the marriage and family space for a long time now with his bride, Leslie, and he's got some great thoughts for us on how to assess how our marriages are doing, what makes for healthy fighting, and what's the difference between a groove and a rut when it comes to your marriage? We've got Les. Les and Leslie Parrott do incredible work helping equip people for marriage, giving you tools for your marriage, and that even includes those pre-engagement years and engagement and into those years of marriage. So Les, thank you so much for being on today. Oh, it's my honor to be with you. Thanks, Julie. Well, you know, I think for a lot of us, we don't always know exactly how healthy are our marriages. I mean, some of us have a, a paradigm where we think, well, gosh, if we have an argument at all, things are falling apart. Some of us have a paradigm where you know, maybe our mom and dad's marriage was really rugged, so we're staying back a bit from that border. How can couples really know how their marriages are doing? How can they really take an assessment, a checkup? Right. Well, there's an old adage in psychology that says awareness is curative. Uh, Once you become aware of something, then you can do something about it. So we have really dedicated the last several years to building tools for couples that'll do just that. Awareness, by the way, in a marriage relationship leads to deeper empathy. And maybe we can talk more about that, that capacity to put ourselves in each other's shoes. But when it comes to just being aware, you know, we we always have a a physical checkup every year, at least we hope we do, you know, see what's going on, you know, and and we look in the mirror every day to see how I'm I'm doing, how's my hair and everything else. Why don't we do the same thing for our marriage relationship? And so that's why we built this thing. It's called the Deep Love Assessment. It's super easy and convenient. And just to give people a little bit of context, my team didn't just sit around in leather chairs one day and say, hey, let's do an assessment. We've been traveling this path for a long time. In fact, wow, 18 years ago, we were at a kitchen table in Pasadena, California with Neil Clark Warren and my wife, Leslie, and his wife, Marilyn. And Neil said, you know, this new internet thing, uh, I wonder if there's a way to match couples on that and really kind of help them do well in matching so we decrease the divorce rate. And that little discussion led to eHarmony. And I know that probably about five, six years into launching that company, I said to Neil one day, I said that the way things are going, we want to do the same thing someday for couples that are already married and create some online magic. And that's really what led us to this whole deep love assessment thing. This wasn't something we just invented out of thin air and, hey, this sounds like a cool opportunity, let's do this. This has been a lifelong mission. It's, it's really a passion project for us. You know, I think sometimes we either decide that our marriages are doing just fine or we've got to get code red to the counselor's office, you know, tomorrow morning. But really what you seem to be describing to me is that place where you don't assume everything's fine. You don't assume everything's a disaster. You really take a look and dig into some different things to get a good picture of what's going on. I know sometimes people can question, you know, what is is an online course, what's the efficacy of that or an online assessment, but what are some of the things that you're seeing? What's some of the feedback that you're getting from people who are using the deep love assessment? Yeah, and by the way, when it comes to efficacy, you know, I'm a psychologist, I'm I'm a social scientist, so I don't do anything unless it has reliability and validity. So I wanna know that it really works. So this thing has been tested every which way and the reliability validity studies are off the charts, uh, truly. The concept is super simple. You go online at deeploveassessment.com. You answer a series of questions and it takes maybe about 15 to 20 minutes per person to do that. You don't answer the questions together. But once you've both completed that, you instantly receive this report. It's about 10 pages in length, and it goes through several different things that are really designed to be positive and upbeat. This is not a shame and blame kind of experience. It's not dragging out all your dirty laundry, and it's just really upbeat kind of stuff. So we start with your personalities, how God designed you, the DNA of your relationship. This is key to emotional and psychological health, right, to know who I am and how I come across to other people, especially to my spouse. 
And so what we do, there's a page, and it has this, the, the very first page of the report has this personality wheel. And there's eight different kind of types, like the achieving spouse and the pioneering spouse, the energizing spouse and the affirming spouse and so forth. And you would think that maybe we just give you one of eight paragraphs, but that's not the case because we have nearly 40,000 variables that go into this. So you really get a customized paragraph about your hardwiring and your spouse's hardwiring. As one couple recently told me, it's, that's just enough. Like, that was enough just to see that page. It was such a kind of groundbreaking experience for them. But that's where we start. And then we give kind of uh, the next page is a combo of your two personalities together. You know, we often say that there's never been a marriage like yours before, and there never will be again because you have this multifaceted person with all their uniqueness and yours, and you combine that and you create a chemistry that hasn't existed before. And so that's what we do in these first two pages is really look at the two of you and the chemistry that you build together. And like I said, that's, that's a huge step towards awareness. We also look at the strengths each of you are bringing in because of your hardware and your personality. And then we, we look at how that impacts problem solving. Did you know that 25% of our conversations in marriage are devoted to how we solve problems together? Wow. So, you know, it's really important to understand, are you a reflective problem solver or an aggressive problem solver? I'm an aggressive problem solver. I'm like, if we got a problem, let's, let's work on it now. What are we waiting for? Let's get on with life. Leslie's reflective. She's like, let's give it time. Things have a way of working them, themselves out. And, you know, when you understand those kinds of things about each other, it just makes life easier. There's deeper, more abiding understanding throughout the relationship. You know, I sometimes have women say to me in my, my ministry part of my world, well, you know, I, I feel like we need to do some things. We need to develop some strengths in the marriage. We need some strategies. But my spouse doesn't really seem interested in pursuing that. How do you help equip people? How do we give people tools? Not that you're trying to talk your spouse into it or guilt them into it, but to take away some of the, sometimes the things that are present that would be objections or if somebody feels like they're gonna be exposed. I love that you said, you know, we do this in a way that it's not about shaming people or anything of that nature. What are some phrases and some aspects that we can help equip people to understand this is not gonna be something that's well, you know, she was right and you were wrong, kind of a kind of an environment. Yeah, exactly. We've set it up this way. In fact, uh, when you take the assessment, it comes with a 40-page downloadable action plan that is really geared around four dates. And it's fun. I mean, we've now had thousands and thousands of couples go through this, so we know kind of what to expect for most couples. And it's like, it's just like these are the four best dates we've had in years because it's kind of dating with a purpose and it's not therapy, it's not counseling. It's like, how do we create more intimacy and more passion in our relationship? How do we move from good to great? Now, if you're in distress, if there's some things that are troubling you in your marriage, it's also a great platform to talk about that stuff, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to take you higher. What if your spouse isn't motivated to work on your relationship like that? Here's the cool thing. When it's not work, <laughs> it's irrelevant, right? And so you shouldn't even look at this kind of thing if you're taking the deep love assessment. You shouldn't even look at it as work. It's a fun activity. It's like uh, going to the movies. It's like watching a show. It's, it's something that's interactive. When you can make it a date, it reframes the whole concept. By the way, do you know dating, this is such hackneyed advice, but we all know that, you know, hey, you should really date as a married couple. We hear that all the time. I was just reading some research, and it shows that it's not just a matter of dating as a married couple, but it's doing something novel, things that you haven't done for a long time that really join your spirits together. Dinner and a movie? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, that's easy. That's like a layup, right? But let's, let's really work on the dating thing to do some innovative things. And this is one way of doing just that so that we're not just kind of stuck in a rut. And I think the process of self-discovery and discovering more about your spouse, I, I don't think that it all has to be a threatening thing. I think it can be absolutely fascinating. And I think that to know that you're going to come out the other side being better known and to yourself and your spouse is something that can be really powerful. I, I'm i wondering, you and Leslie have been in this marriage game interpersonally for a long time and of course in your careers and the things that you're doing to try to help and, and really empower marriages. 
What are some things you're seeing now in marriages that maybe you didn't see as much, you know, a few years ago? What are things about today's marriages that surprise you a little bit or things that you're finding that you want to address? Well, there's some new wrinkles, I suppose, a lot around social media, but the the tried and true things are still, it's just been the same for a long time. Communication and conflict, those are two skill sets that just can make or break a, a couple's life together. And so even though we might have these little nuances of different things that are kind of uh, novel for this day and age with things like I mentioned social media, I think if couples get the basic skills of communicating, you know, I often, when Leslie and I do a seminar or something, I often say, can you imagine if we could put an addition onto your home, your apartment, your condo, your house, where it would be a room, whenever you went into this room, you would have the greatest conversations of your life. Can you imagine? You, you wouldn't have to edit your thoughts. You wouldn't have to weigh your words. You could just speak freely and you'd be guaranteed to be understood. Not only that, you'd be guaranteed to be understanding. Can you imagine that? You come home from the end of the day at work and you go, hey, meet me in the room, right? I gotta talk, yeah, we gotta talk yeah. about something. And who wouldn't want that kind of space? Well, it's true today, as it has been for decades, that that desire in our relationship to have that kind of emotional intimacy through communication is still priority number one. It's still the number one thing that couples want most out of their relationship is that kind of a connection. The second thing that we know about couples today, and this is a little bit new for this generation, but is quality time together. Because of our devices that we all carry around and it's distracting and we're getting beeped and buzzed and all that, and it's just, it sometimes is difficult to be fully present. And so I suppose that would go to the top of my list of what we're seeing that's new for couples today that maybe wasn't uh, as big of a deal a few years back, that quality time. How do you reclaim moments that you've been missing together when so many things are clamoring for your attention? That's a big one. And, and by the way, in the Deep Love Assessment, we have a page on your time styles. And it has to do with whether you're scheduled or unscheduled. Do you know what you are, Julie? Are you scheduled or unscheduled? You know, as a mom of eight, um, <laughs> I think I'm. I think I'm in crisis management. I don't know that that really <laughs> makes me scheduled or unscheduled. I can feel like I have a, a very scheduled approach, and then it can become unscheduled so quickly in our family. Do you, do you have a mechanism? Do you have a day timer? Do you have something on your phone that you know what you're doing next Tuesday at three o'clock? Oh, yes. I've got the written yeah. planner. I've got it online. I've got notifications on my phone, all of that. Yeah, you're scheduled then. You're scheduled. Yeah. So my wife is unscheduled. She doesn't even keep a like a date book on her phone or anything like that. Is that legal? But is that allowed? Is I that know. It's, well, there's believe it or not, there's people like that out there. In fact, about 50% of the population is like that. For those of us that are highly scheduled, it's like, what? How can, how can you live like that? So you ask Leslie, uh, hey, what are you doing next Tuesday at 3? Do you guys want to you want to get a cup of coffee together? And she'll kind of look up in the sky for a second and go, uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. That sounds good, right? So that's one kind of indicator is are you scheduled or unscheduled? And then the other is are you future-oriented or present-oriented? Now, I'm future-oriented. Leslie, in fact, says I'm a visitor from the future. I'm all about planning. I love setting goals. I love what's around the corner. What are we doing next? And then other people are right here, right now. Not the there and them, but the here and now. Which of those are you? If you were, I'm, have, I'm definitely future. I'm, I'm always, what's the next mountain? <laughs> yeah. Let's go. So you would be scheduled and future-oriented, which makes you a planner in this model and uh, that's what I am too. I'm part planner and then part dreamer which is unscheduled in future. Leslie's an accommodator. She is unscheduled and present oriented so she accommodates time. It's not like how long does it take to walk there? Oh I think it's about five minutes. It could be 20 minutes but because it's a nice walk it feels like five minutes. You know it's just like time is very fluid but not for the planner. It's those kinds of things, when we become aware of it, we can begin to manage our time together more effectively. And that's the number one thing I see about this generation that might be a little bit different than others. We've always had the issue of time, but because we have these phones that we carry around, we get distracted so easily. Even when we dedicate our time to going out for a date or whatever, to turn that thing off, it's, it's pretty difficult to do for most of us. 
We'll be back to this intriguing conversation with Les Parrott about how to assess how our marriages are doing and what makes for a good fight. <laughs> we'll be back to that here in just a bit. But first, I want to make sure you know about a phenomenal resource for moms. It's a community called Mops. For over 40 years, Mops has been inviting women into community through the commonality of motherhood, building friendships, and earning the opportunity to share Jesus with them, maybe for the first time. Mops believes that all moms are world influencers and exist to encourage and equip all moms everywhere to live their best lives. Check out mops.org to find a local gathering in your neighborhood. And now back to our conversation with Les Parrott. I'm really interested with some of the couples I'm working with who are in that engagement phase. And of course, you and Leslie have developed a tool called Symbus, which I think is amazing. I've had the honor of taking two different couples through it, through the engagement process. And one thing that I find interesting, even with my children who are of dating age, we've got kids starting at the age of 27 all the way down to 10-year-old twins. My kids that are dating, even the way in which they approach their relationships are so much on the digital platform. You know, when Mike and I dated, we would get on the the phone with the long, long extension cord and there was really no, you couldn't go very far. You could kind of wander back and forth between the kitchen and and the laundry room maybe, but you really had to be present even if you were using technology to connect. I'm watching my kids who are dating really establish relationship through a series of text messages. How do you think that's gonna impact a couple's ability on down the line? to know how to be present with each other and and to put those devices down when that device sometimes has been the very foundation of the communication for the relationship. Yeah, like so many things in life, it's a double-edged sword and there's there's positive things that it offers and negative things as well. And uh, some of us, I think, kind of just uh, wanna throw it all away because it's just tearing us apart and all that kind of thing. I don't think that's the solution. In fact, I was just reading a, a little book by Andy Crouch who talked about the idea is just to put technology in its place. Just make sure it has its place, which really comes down to boundaries, right? that we're using it in the right way with the right amount of time. Leslie and I have two boys, both teenagers, and the oldest one, he's not into social media, but it's gaming and stuff, and like he could spend all day on a screen. And the second boy is like so self-monitored, he's got this sensitive little soul, and he's just like, uh, too much screen time, Dad, too much screen, we gotta get outside, you know? And so it has to do with personalities. And it has to do with boundaries and helping your young people, you know, manage that in their lives by modeling it. And that's the tough part, right? To model it because we say, hey, don't don't be so focused on that. And then we do it ourselves. Guilty. Um, Guilty as charged yeah. right here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I do think it's fascinating, though, that you see that personality plays a role in how we do manage our digital lives. I think that's a really interesting concept. Yeah. Personality influences everything, right? It it influences how we relate to God. It it influences uh, uh, how we approach our our money in our lives, and certainly it impacts our relationships. So it's difficult to exaggerate the importance of of personality and everything. You know, I think one of the things that comes up a lot in marriages that I'm around and questions that I'm asked is how much fighting is healthy. You know, I know people who feel like their marriages are doing just fine because they just have a throwdown, you know, maybe once, twice a month. And I know people who would feel crushed by that kind of frequency of fighting. I know that you and Leslie have an event that you do called Fight Night. So what are some of the parameters that you see in marriages? What's the difference between healthy fighting and fighting that is really, really damaging? What can you do and how can you understand as a spouse when you're over the line in one of those places? Yeah, well, there's a lot of good questions in there. Conflict is a huge issue. Like I said, it's a huge skill set that we need to cultivate. John Gottman, a a friend and colleague here in Seattle, has probably done more research on conflict in marriage than anybody else on the planet. And he's been able to predict with a 94% accuracy rate whether a couple will succeed or fail in their marriage based solely on how they fight. Now think about this, not what they fight about, not how often they fight, but how are they fighting and what is he looking for? He's looking for four things and he calls these the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, (laughs) Sounds dire. I know, they really usher in doom for a couple. The first one is criticism. Every conflict begins with a critical comment that we make. You always make us late. You never pick up your clothes, right? That's what sparks a conflict. That leads then to defensiveness, 
after criticism is defensiveness, which is natural. You're going to put up your guard. You're going to put on your armor. You're going to hold up your shield whenever you're criticized. That's just a reflex. Um, and then that leads to contempt. And contempt is anything that basically makes you feel about an inch tall. It's belittling. It's usually some kind of character assassination. It's sometimes sarcastic. Way to go, Einstein. Regular genius, aren't you? You know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're contemptuous sometimes without even uttering a word, just rolling our eyes at each other, you know? And then finally, that leads to stonewalling, where you just shut down. Um, and if you don't leave the, the space physically, you leave emotionally. And by the way, guys tend to get to stonewalling quicker than women do, and women tend to get to criticism faster than men do. So you can see that, that kind of bookend effect, right? Right, right. I'm sure some are listening to us going, oh, this doesn't sound good because I got some of this in my relationship. <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, we all have some of this in our relationship, and so the, the key is knowing how to short circuit that. And, and that's why we do this event, as you mentioned, around the country. We do it about 25 times a year in various churches called Fight Night. It's centered around a fundamental belief, and that is that conflict is the price we pay for deeper intimacy. So Let we don't have to that. be scared of conflict. I mean, what a great statement. You know, we don't have to be scared of conflict. Say it again. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Conflict is the price we pay for a deeper level of intimacy. In other words, if you know how to fight a good fight, it actually brings you closer together. So the goal is not to avoid conflict. Conflict is inevitable. In fact, my favorite Bible verse on conflict, Romans 12, 18, says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, try to live at peace with everybody. I don't know of another verse that has more qualifiers in it than that single verse. If it's possible, try and give it a shot, do what you can, but you're going to have conflict. And so what do you do to manage that conflict well? That's the question, right? How do you manage that well? How do you short circuit those four things so that you don't end up in a stonewalling kind of way? Most of us were afraid of conflict, like you alluded to, so we think the best thing is to avoid it. You can't do that. Most personality types cannot avoid conflict. Uh, and there's some aggressive fighters. I, I happen to be an aggressive fighter. If we have a problem, I want to get at it right now. And I probably want to show you why I'm right. Leslie is still a vocal fighter, but she's more flexible than I am. Her, her goal is not to win the fight. It's just kind of like, let's win together. And then you have people that are fighters that really in quote I'm putting air quotes up because they're not fighters at all they're they're just more if they have a problem you wouldn't even know it because they hold it so close to the vest and they have to think about it when something's bothering them they retreat they aren't vocal about it I remember when we first started doing research we wrote this book called the good fight when we first started doing research on it I remember thinking there's couples that just lie about fighting they say we never had a fight we've been married for 40 years and we never had a fight and it wasn't until I understand how important their personality types are. If you have two people that are conflict avoidant like that, they really don't fight. Right. Just doesn't get just doesn't come up. <laughs> right. And so the growing edge for them is to really be more authentic and um, and come together with what's really bothering them. So anyway, I I'm glad you asked the question because conflict is uh, I think if I could give a wedding gift to a couple uh, it would be how to manage conflict successfully, if I could give anything in the world, because uh, it's inevitable. We all have it. And if we do it right, it brings us closer together. What do you see? Now, I think a lot of us know that, you know, by the time we see a marriage trip over into infidelity or there comes this place where, you know, the differences seem irreconcilable. But we know there probably was a history and a story behind all that that started kind of way back. What are some things that couples can not be scared of, but on alert for that if those patterns continue to be replicated over time, it's not going to yield the happy relationship you want it to, but they can be things that can be adapted and talked about and treated now before it becomes something that really is a lot more difficult to deal with down the lane. Well, that's a big question with lots of uh, ways to come at it, but um, I, I would say the first thing that comes to my mind is that every couple needs to ensure that your basic needs for connection and intimacy are being met in your marriage. Um, now we all go through seasons in our married life where that sometimes is tough to do. There's physical illness, there's challenges, there's whatever, there's there's travel, what, whatever that, that kind of makes it 
particularly difficult, but that's the key. Most affairs, most breakdowns in a relationship are the result of, you know, you, you hear couples that say, well, we just grew apart. I think that's the lamest excuse ever for a marriage not working. You don't just grow apart. Uh, you choose how, what direction you grow in. And so you grow together. And if you're not talking about that, if you're not, you know, uh, you know, Leslie and I are, are so excited because in about another month, we're going to, we're going to chart our course for the coming year. We do that every year around this time. And it's always exciting. We look back on the last year. What were the highlights? What were the things we planned on? What were the serendipitous things that were so cool? And what would we like to see repeated in this coming year? As we chart that course, we're super intentional about making sure we're growing in the same direction, that we have the same goals that we're working on. And to me, that's maybe some of the best insurance you can have against your relationship going off the rails. I think that intentionality is such a key component. And I think maybe some of us grew up just assuming that marriage was just something you sort of knew how to do. Adults got married, that's what they did, and it didn't really <laughs> take much forethought or much intentionality to it. But I think that intentionality is such a key piece. And that's part of what I love about the deep love assessment that y'all have developed is that it really is that place of being intentional to understand one another, to see what the patterns are, to celebrate what's working really well, and then to get really intentional in the places that strengths can be developed. Yeah, and we can all do that, regardless of our personality type or our attitude toward marriage. It all comes down to intention. I've been reading a lot these days about habit. 40% 40% of the actions that we have in a typical day are not decisions that we make. They're just things we do because we're on autopilot and it becomes a habit. If you're looking at whether you're in shape physically, that has to do with habits that you've cultivated. Your financial health, that has to do with habits. Well, the same is true with your marriage. The state of your marriage has so much to do with the habits that the two of you have carved out together. And there's something that researchers call keystone habits. These are habits that are so important that they have a ripple effect, kind of a trickle-down effect to other habits in your life, and they can change everything. When you have a keystone habit in your marriage that we're intentional, that we work on it, other things seem to fall into place because we're prioritizing this relationship. And, And you're exactly right, Julie. That's why we love talking to couples about this deep love assessment. It's such an easy way to do it. I absolutely love Charles Duhigg's book, uh, The Power of Habit. His Keystone Habits, that entire concept is so amazing when you really think about how our brains seek efficiency. And so we can think of our marriages as very much heart issues, but there is a point at which your brain's just going for what is the most efficient, particularly when you've got little kids underfoot, you've got crazy schedules, you do the thing that feels most efficient, but to be very intentional about what we do to our brains when we think about our marriages and our interactions is so critical. What would you say are keystone habits for a marriage? I mean, obviously doing things, you said making sure that your date nights include something that's a little bit novel, a new experience, something like deep love assessment. You haven't done that before. That's a little bit novel. What are a couple of other keystone habits? I know that personality plays a huge role, but that you see to be pretty universal when it comes to marriages, that is a habit that really can help solidify and and grow and nurture that relationship. I think they're different for each couple because of this whole idea of of our personalities and our preferences and so forth. But there's a big difference between ruts and grooves, right? We can fall into a rut that isn't necessarily productive. A groove, we fall into a pattern of behavior that definitely has a payoff, a positive, healthy payoff for us. I'll give you one for Leslie and me. We live in downtown Seattle and there's a lake that is not very far from where we live and it's called Green Lake and it it takes about 45 minutes to walk around that lake. We have some of our best conversations while we're walking around that lake. There's something about being in motion and there's activity and it's nature and there's just some and you're passing other people and there's something about that environment that brings out the best conversations for us. So we realize we don't want to just let that happen when it happens. We're going to be intentional about that. So we walk around that lake at least three times a week. We've been doing it for so long right now. It's like there'd be something dramatically wrong in our lives if we weren't walking around Green Lake. It is a groove that we've fallen into. We don't even think about it. We don't even talk about, hey, are we going to go? We just like, it's time. Let's go. And and we find ourselves walking to that lake. And I, I love it that you've read that book and you know that our brain, the gray matter in our brain, relaxes 
when we don't have to think about something, we don't have to exert a lot of effort because we've carved that groove into our life to do that. And, and we do that with our family too. Monday night at our house is pizza night. And I'm sure other families listening to us have similar things like this. But I'm telling you, we look for it's like we're going to Disneyland every Monday night. Well, Les, I love what you're saying about ruts and grooves. I mean, I just I think that is brilliant because I think sometimes we can think our marriage is in a rut because we're doing some of the same things like the walk around Green Lake. But we need to look at what's the fruit of that. And I think something that is producing good fruit in our marriage it's kind of awesome if it's something that's our thing. You know, you were saying that your family has a, a pizza night and that's a great thing for your family. It's not necessarily novel, but it creates a groove that is something that is very functional for y'all. It's a time to connect. Now tell me what a rut is. How is a rut different than a groove? Well, a rut is where you find yourself doing something like coming home from work and I'm just exhausted. And so uh, the greeting goes something like, hey, how you doing? Good. How's your day? Good. I'm going to go in and uh, play video games now or I'm going to go read the paper or whatever it is. And there's no real intention about that. You know, we're always following the path of least resistance. And so you've got to make sure that that path you know, I, I, I grew up in Boston. The city streets in Boston are literally the result of where cows used to walk. And so the, <laughs> the streets make no sense in Boston, okay? Uh, and it was just the path of least resistance, and eventually those became the roads. We need to not fall into that trap, but we need to be intentional about carving out a path, a groove, that is productive for us. And that might take some work, you know, it might take a couple months till we kind of get into the pattern of being more healthy. So when we come home from work, we set our stuff down and we have 20 minutes or five minutes or whatever it is of face-to-face -face talking so that we're two human beings together. That's what I mean by the difference between a rut and a groove. That's, that's amazing. So much phenomenal wisdom, so many great tools that you've provided today. And just can't thank you enough for all that you and Leslie are doing to really equip and encourage and empower couples to not not just stay together, but really make something beautiful, really make something that is transcendent and is going to have legacy to it for those who come after. So thank you for all the work you do. Tell me where we can find the Deep Love Assessment, where we can find your books, where you are on social media, all those amazing places where you have these storehouses of wisdom and resources for us. Yeah, thanks. And it's an honor to be on your program with you. Uh, people can find the Deep Love Assessment that we've been talking about. And if you can't tell, I'm pretty excited about that thing. <laughs> so they find that at uh, Deep Love Assessment dot com deeploveassessment.com and then all of our resources and anything they any you know books or whatever people are interested in they can find it less and leslie.com and obviously there's a link there to the assessment too so less and leslie.com can't thank you enough for being here and for just investing so well with the experiences that you've had the, the wisdom that you have for modern moms and the marriages that they're leading so thanks so much well, I know that I was taking notes through that entire conversation with Les Parrott. Want to make sure that for those of you in the Washington area, there's actually a fight night event coming up with he and Leslie. We'll be sure and link to that in the show notes so that you can take a look at that. And he and Leslie are on all the social medias. Look for Les and Leslie, and you'll find them on Facebook, on Twitter, all the places. And you want to make sure and get hold of some of those great resources that he mentioned as well. I want to be in touch with you too. You can find me on all the social media. Is Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Julie Lyles Carr, and also at my website at julililes.car.com. And be sure and check out all the social media for All Mom Does. We've got a fantastic blog with all kinds of great resources for you, for your marriage, for raising kids, for your work, all the things. So be sure and check it out. A big thank you to Donna Toady, who is our producer, and to Rebecca Beckett, our content coordinator. They're the ones who make this whole thing possible. Coming up next week, you love her gorgeous, soulful voice, and we're going to have an amazing conversation about creativity, being a mom, and when God has you on you, what you think you know the path is, and then he changes things up a bit. We've got the soulful J.J. Heller coming up next time on the Modern Motherhood Podcast.